God. L okay, let, 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 me, let me do this intro. Let me do this real ass intro here. Okay. So to everyone watching, thank you for being here. Today, my guest is singer, spoken word artist, and punk legend Jello Biafra of Dead Kennedys, Alternative Tentacles, Lard, and Guantanamo School of Medicine, and many more, but uh, that project has an album coming out very soon that we will talk about. Since the 1970s, Jello's work has been nothing short of provocative, perceptive, and predictive, and I'm hoping in this conversation to squeeze what few insights he has left out of him uh, during this very dire time socially and politically. Uh, how are you doing, man? Well, I never run out of ideas and thoughts when uh, people act so ridiculous, and in this case, dangerously ridiculous, all over the world. Well, it's, uh, I mean, both Mark Mothersbaugh and Jerry Casale of Devo have now pointed out that the whole trump phenomenon, Trump and the trump followers, um, T-R-U-M-P-Z-I, hmm. that's, you know, solid scientific proof that de-evolution is actually happening. All right, let me throw you uh, my first question over here. Um, according to my observations, it's been a uh, like 35 years since the release of uh, uh, the legendary Dead Kennedys track, MTV Get Off the Air, which for a frame of reference, that was like the year I was born. And um, that was you know, 85. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's some great legitimate satirical criticisms of that media entity uh, throughout that track that, uh, you know, are fantastic. And I think it withstood the test of time in a way. But uh, what hasn't withstood the test of time is kind of MTV itself. It's not quite as relevant as kind of a social decider of what's hot and what's not as it used to be. And, and now it sort of seems like the Internet has become that forum. But um, I think have, that's a better thing, too. Well, it's in, in some respects, I would I would wholeheartedly agree. But do you think in a way that, you know, things like streaming platforms are kind of becoming the new gatekeeper in a way, sort of like almost like a replacement for MTV? That's only if you, the consumer, treat the Internet and streaming as a gatekeeper. Mm. The gatekeeper is imposed in your mind. Not by them. They may have suggestions if you want to go down that rabbit hole. But th this is a whole wider discussion of the digital age. And, you know, some, I, I have a Luddite reputation and kind of for good reason. But I all recognize from the beginning that this is not bad. It's good. It's just a matter of are you using the tools or are the tools using you? And if you let any streaming service decide what they're going to play you next, you're letting them use you, but that's similar to radio, which a lot of us grew up on anyway. And as soon as I could buy records and found out you could get cheap ones that used record stores and buy more records, I began, you know, my lifelong fallout shelter against bad 70s radio. Hmm. And since I pretty much, you know, I, I'd unplugged from popular culture in general consciously around eighth grade and never really paid that much attention to it anyway because my family didn't either. We had other things going on, including even when I was five and six years old watching the evening news when it was a lot less censored, bloody Vietnam War footage or uh, people marching across the bridge in Selma getting hosed and dogs and everything else. It was explained to the children instead of changing the channel. So I had very strong views you now know well from a very early age. And I'm really grateful that I was so interested in that and passionate in that. And because at the same time, I found out about rock and roll. I was very passionate about that too. Mm -hmm. And so I not only, I guess, felt, experienced all the cool stuff as well as the bad stuff of the 60s at a much deeper level, even than most people I know my age who don't remember it nearly as well as I do. And they, he can sing a TV commercial jingle and they remember it immediately, though. What does that say? <laughs> but anyway, but that I also experienced all the culture and all the cool music and how it all connected all at once. Mm. And this was even before punk. I mean, I was in despair by the mid, you know, even, even the bicentennial year, 76, whatever, that the music would go on, there was no more Stooges, no more Pink Fairies, no more Hawkwind, and all this stuff was in the past. Plus, I kind of like to do it too, but I just live in the middle of Colorado, not Hollywood, and I can't play as good as Jimmy Buffett. And uh, so you know, there was nothing for me, and it looked like it was all dying, and then punk happened. It was like, aha, I was born at the perfect time. 
Oh my. You know, that door may never be open again. <laughs> you know, I, I have another question that kind of goes off of what I initially threw at you, but that's that's kind of a funny oh, observation. Let, let me finish on MTV too. I got to say yeah. something about MTV. Is that all right? Well, 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 well. Before you make that comment, I wanted to say. Um, I, I think that's kind of a funny observation, you know, not being able to play as well as Jimmy and then punk kind of came into frame because in my opinion, technically speaking, like dead Kennedy's usually showcase like a, at least a higher level of musicianship than a lot of other punk bands out there, you know, sort of around that time, like, you know, Klaus and East Bay Ray alone, like, you know, put some fantastic guitar work into those records. Yeah. And then we had drummer power behind us yeah, too, which yeah, not everybody had. Hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, at first I thought, you know, they were so technical on me. This is, you know, California Uber Alice violates music theory. This isn't how the chorus goes. This is how the chorus goes. No, this is how the chorus goes. That took weeks because it's not a regular time signature. But I began to realize after a while, especially when Klaus said, quit trying to pick the notes out on your guitar, just sing them to us. And, uh, and then I could make up more sophisticated stuff knowing they could play it. Hmm. So instead of having this purist view, you know, believing, which I think was actually a myth, that people like the Stooges and Pierre Ubu had no idea how to play any instruments when they started, which I'm not sure was really true. I mean, if, you know, suddenly they got to do actual songs, Stooges signed to Electra and Ron Ashton plays awfully well, and the others do too. So anyway, so I began to realize actually, okay, this is the tools that this band has, let's use it to an advantage. I mean, I began blundering into surf instrumental and saxophone instrumental 45s when in thrift stores and stuff because I was trying to find 60s garage 45s and, you know, guessing on the, uh, you know, on the, on the name, the band names and the titles. So I started liking that too. And that was kind of my secret weapon for years because nobody was listening to that stuff. Mm. You know, and then, yeah, you could come up with something like Too Drunk to Fuck and then, um, Winnebago Warrior was originally an instrumental in my head where what became the vocal part was originally the high guitar lead, but I'm useless with instruments, so you got to get something for the singer to do. Mm. So I put in a chorus, and there was too drunk to fuck. But the point also being by then I realized that because Ray and Klaus were like 10 to 12 years older than me, they were already in their 30s, mm. um, they knew how to play that stuff. They were fluent in that easily. Mm. I mean, Klaus is a really good guitar player as well as a bass player, although not... Punk would not be his forte, but you hear him play, you know, twang instrumental on a hollow body Gretsch or even blues or something. He'll slay it. Um, going back to some of the, you know, streaming conversation and Internet stuff. I mean, you talked a lot about how culturally, uh, you know, this kind of compares to your past and sort of how you came up in music and politics and kind of understanding that outside of a mainstream bubble. But current day. Uh, while, again, personally, you seem to have this opinion that it's kind of freed things up, leveled the playing field to an extent, and I do agree, like, how do you feel about kind of navigating this current landscape of music dissemination as a creator yourself, and, and also as somebody who's running a label? It's a work in progress, and I have to trust my own staff and other people who are more into the digital thing than I am. I mean, the beauty of what we have now is somebody really curious about weird music or cool music and is open to magic accidents. You know, if they blunder into something they really like that they'd never heard of or initially hated, but then listen to it again. Hey, wait a minute, there's something here. And then later it becomes one of your favorite or even influential artists in the case of the kind of obnoxiously naval <laughs> voice of Peter Ivers teaching me in a way that, you know, ooh, it's weird voice. I get that in high school, but then like, wait a minute, that's a great weapon. I mean, the best thing a singer can have, even if you have the vocal range of Lou Reed, is that somebody, the minute you open your mouth, they know it's you. And, and so, um, you know, but, but, but magic accidents, it's, it's still there. I mean, you just have to not be afraid of your own curiosity and um, just kind of float around. I mean, one thing I get too into sometimes is I'll try to list, find out a song on YouTube. They're, okay, there it is. Then there's all these other songs they want you to play. And then I start checking some of those out too. Oh, God, this is really good. This is really good. I'll never find this record, but I'll write it down. But the beauty of that is... 
It doesn't mean you have to fill up your house with vinyl like Cello Biafra does. <laughs> it means practically everything is available now. Yeah. I mean, imagine trying to find rockabilly records in 1975, if that was your thing, or even one other person anywhere in your state who liked rockabilly records. Now, you could, everything is in print, basically. Mm-hmm. Everything. You don't have to pay these collector prices. You can just listen to it. And I think that's great. Yeah, you know, now, that's now, nowadays, you don't have to worry about any gatekeepers doing anything. You just start looking around, mm-hmm. like I still do, both digitally and in thrift stores and record stores. I rarely go in, do you have this in stock? Knowing they probably don't, because I couldn't find it anywhere, anywhere else either. I just go, okay, what am I going to find in this store? You know, I, I went with some friends in that British space rock band, The Heads, to a record fair. I think it was Reading. And that one, they called them boot sales, boot of a car, trunk of a car. And, oh, God, psych records, psych records, psych records. Instead, I blundered into a bunch of old instrumental 45s connected with that really bizarre producer named Joe Meek. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not or whatever. I've I've heard the name, yeah. You might have heard is Telstar by the Tornadoes. The ah, Meek was not only had all kinds of talents, fiercely independent, broke the mold as a producer and a writer, likes the Phil Spector of England. If anything, he was weirder than Phil Spector was in the long run. Hmm. He was about as good with instruments as I am. But you know, for the Telstar organ, the notes weren't enough. You had to match the organ tone he heard in his head, or he would jump up and down until you did. And his recording studio was in this really narrow English type building where you have have one floor there and you could almost touch the walls and stuff. So people had to set up their instruments on different floors. And if he came to a, you know, he got kind of got stuck, didn't know what he wanted to do. He would consult Buddy Holly on a Ouija board. (laughs) You were given some really sick music recommendations, kind of, you know, tacitly. Uh, But to recommend your own music, you do have this uh, Guantanamo school record coming out pretty soon. Um, the lyrics and the, I'm you know, the content, at least online within a couple of weeks or three at the most. Okay. I mean, you know, it's a while to get the hard copies made because of the turnaround time in manufacturing. Hmm. And there was some back and forth with the mastering that I think is now finally resolved, but to get it out before the election at a time when most people listen digitally anyway, then just get it out there. Well, you know, there's a couple more of those videos coming down too. Hmm. So, uh, well, speaking of that, the get ready you know, for the fun. Well, the content of the album, from what I've observed so far, I mean, it's like you guys are kind of going at Trump, Putin, everything in between. Um, you know, do do you? I mean, you kind of addressed it there a little bit, but um, in your own mind, as a creator, especially somebody who comments so openly and so boldly on current day issues, politics, so on and so forth, you know, do you personally sweat or worry about the moment you record or? Put something out maybe it's either irrelevant in a way or not tuned up or up to date as it could be because things are always changing it seems like the news cycle is moving faster and faster and faster well than it's i have been conscious of that and that has played a role in my abandoning the spoken word shows hmm. and instead doing those little rant casts on youtube that you can find at the alternative tentacles channel yeah. called the, uh, the what would jello what do would jello do yeah hmm. my little thrift store what would jesus do shirt with my name and masking tape over the <laughs> other name hmm. you know uh, you know that people complain about how low the production value is on that but i'm saying hey wait a minute that's the entire idea i don't have i can't do a band and put together a two to four hour spoken word show at the same time so i just say this and then it's done it's in the spirit of what Frank Zappa called strings attached to the jaws of the giant spider. And um, so, but another way I'm conscious of it is I try to design the songs, not all of them, but 99% of them so that they're, they're going to last, even if I'm talking about a particular person at that time. Mm. I don't know how much more you were going to play Barack Star Obummer at this point, especially mm. because people are so nostalgic for him now because of what happened afterwards. A mm. much more extreme example of George W. Bush making Bill Clinton look good, yeah. but not too many people could. Mm. And um, But I, I first learned that the hard way after California Uber Alice. 
Mm. You know, there was my own pet theory. Nobody else had thought of this. And I just come fresh off the boat from Boulder, Colorado, where you couldn't go two blocks without bumping into another cult, usually with a guru. And all these people who were so rebellious a few years before wanted somebody to think for them. Mm. And, you know, I could tell Jerry Brown kind of ha- understood that culture and was saying things like people are looking for a man on a white horse and I'll live, move left wing and right wing at the same time. You watch me. And I kind of put two and two together when, you know, two and two weren't necessarily together because even though I had just fled a town where there really were a lot of touchy feely hanging plant, I want to mellow out all the time, basic fascists. We're just like, that's negative. Don't do that. That's harsh. And, you know, we have that going on again. But anyway, um, and I kind of overreacted to it without looking at the big picture, without looking about that so-called silent majority who went for Nixon or the hard hats who showed up to beat up anti-Vietnam War protesters with axe handles later on and stuff, kind of like now. So... Reagan storms in instead and scares the shit out of everybody for good reason. And even then, worst case scenario, I don't think anybody who knew how horrible and corrupt Reagan was had any idea how much worse it was going to get with both Bushes and Trump amok and everything else. But when Reagan got in, Jerry Falwell quickly took credit for getting him there and kind of acted like he had the right to tell the president what to do. And that's where a track like we've got a bigger problem now kind of comes into play. Yeah, well, exactly. I thought, okay, I was wrong about Jerry Brown. I need to fix this now. Hmm. And we'd already been goofing around with sound check with that jazzier version of the song and stuff. You know, another advantage of having people with the musical chops of uh, Ray Klaus and first Ted, the drummer, then uh, D.H. Pellegro, is you could goof around like that and stuff. And even Will Shatter, of all people, from Flipper, when we played a hilariously out-of-control gig at a half-bar, half-Chinese restaurant in Sacramento called the China Wagon, saying, why don't you ever play that version live? And then that was the excuse. Rewrite the lyrics for Reagan, call it a big, we've got a bigger problem now. Hmm. And uh, the, the, the talking part over the loungy jazz in those two places, the intro of the bridge, that's improvised. So it changed every night, yeah. including in the studio. There was no script. And, um, but then eventually Reagan wasn't there and I hadn't played that stuff live for years. And the Melvins really wanted to do dead Kennedy songs. In addition to, to the ones we'd recorded together, the new songs and stuff, mm-hmm. I only wanted to do new but they eventually talked me into it in part Buzz and Dale saying, look, part of the reason we wanted to start a band was seeing you guys at Blotty Blah Hall with 10 Minute Warning and Mr. Epp and whatnot in Seattle way back in 83. We really like those songs and we want to play them. And so they chose some and they, of course, chose things like Drug Me and Life Sentence, and which Dale wouldn't have chosen if he knew what that, that did to his arms when he played it. But um, but we but we did it. And I said, so, no, we got, if we're going to do this, we've got to do some of the audience favorites. So we also had California Uber Alice and Cambodia and then mm. Guantanamo School of Medicine added Too Drunk to Fuck and Kill the Poor and Nazi punks later, Nazi Trumps fuck off. Yeah. After people in Eastern Europe and South America who had lived under real fascist dictatorships, you know, and had, were very courageous in trying to fight that and great risk to their lives. And one of their sustaining things, little did I know how much was punk hmm. and which was pr- practically forbidden to play in a lot of those places, too, which hmm. just hardened their resolve. They're saying that that song, Nazi punks fuck off, was one of the one of our rallying cries. It means so much to us. Please play it again. So we've been playing it again. And and that one has a spoken intro now with a little bit of a slow funk groove from the bass and the drums and the guitar as I talk over it and move it from why I originally did the song about violence in the pit, people asking like Nazis to the real ones and stuff. And um, God, I forget what the original question was. I have a bad habit with that thing. It's like that. Oh, changing topics. Yeah. So that was a case where I, that was my first one. Okay. I can't risk so many of my songs that are supposed to be protesty songs hmm. freezing in time. Like a lot of what say folk singers like Tom Paxton and even Phil Oaks, 
mm-hmm. and Dave Van Ronk and some of the others, they were very like LBJ this or this, that, and the other. Like, I got to watch that. I got to be careful with that and try and make it, even if it's a specific thing, like a song about the moral majority. Even though the Circle Jerks and the DC band called Youth Brigade, which grew out of the Teen Idols, um, they already had moral majority songs. So I was like, well, the one we do and the one I'm about to write, that's going to be the one everybody's going to hear. Mm. So I have to make a better one. <laughs> mm. And that's what I did. And then there were already songs earlier about the neutron bomb, which even Jimmy Carter was kind of pushing uh, a, an, an atomic bomb that killed people but spared property. Hmm. And then Devo, in an interview in Search and Destroy, the greatest punk scene ever made, where they people hardly ever talked about punk, but even William Burroughs was considered an interview-worthy punk for that magazine and stuff. Hmm. Best zine ever. It, it's been reprinted in book form by research publications, which is what the, 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 uh, grew out of Search and Destroy. But anyway, the, the, among the other things Devo said, as well as more details about de-evolution, was, hey, this neutron bomb, the reason they're pushing this is to seize property from poor people by getting them out of the way. Hmm. My language, not theirs. But that was the gist of what they said. And I thought, okay, there's a weirdo's neutron bomb song. There's a controller's neutron bomb song, both of which were out of Southern California. Ah, all that method acting training I had in high school or even played Ebenezer Scrooge and the Karloff character in Arsenic Old Lace. All right, let's put that hat on and do a pro neutron bomb song from the point of view of whack jobs at the Pentagon and big business. Yeah. Thus, kill the poor. Kill the poor, yeah. Well, um, you know, another thing. Um, but, but, and that one stands. Now, now what, one last thing to say about that is um, yeah. believe it or not, the new album, the new Guantanamo School of Medicine album, is called Tea Party Revenge Porn, mm-hmm. which is also the title track. And that song, and Satan's Comb Over, even, the song that opens the album, they were written before Trump stole the 2016 election. Hmm. And I repeat the word stole. It wasn't Putin. It wasn't the Electric College. They played a part. But it, the interstate cross-check program, which was the mother of all gerrymandering scams involving 29 states, that's what did it. Detailed in a film called... Uh, the Best Democracy Money Can Buy, directed by the producer and author, writer Greg Palast, who wrote a book of the same name about how W stole the election in Florida in 2000. Hmm. Anyway, but to me, Satan's comb over, it's not just Trump. You can't confine this stuff to just him. It's a phenomenon. It's a worldwide phenomenon that freaks me the fuck out that it was... So many of these types of people popped up all over the world at once, mainly the industrialized world, and were vaulted into being pop stars by corporate cartoon McNews just by making them more visible villains and thus a magnet for more right-wingers and racists and stuff who finally felt they could properly express themselves, I guess. I don't know. Hmm. But I kind of trace it to uh, the National Front in France. Jean-Marie Le Pen and now his daughter Marine running it and stuff. And, you know, they've never come close to the presidency, but they keep getting more votes. Yeah. They keep running. A little running bit after that, closer. Brexit. Yeah. Which grew out of the British National Front, which was very openly white supremacist from way back when. Hmm. Rock Against Racism was originally formed to counter Eric Clapton in 77, 78, who publicly endorsed the National Front was buddies with their infamous leader Enoch Powell and so other rock musicians I think starting with punk new wave reggae but then bigger ones got involved like no we will not stand for this rock against racism and it's all of us and it should be you too you're not alone come with us and um, so uh, then uh, you know there's AFD Alternative for Deutschland in Germany who's getting scarier and scarier and then our good friend who um does our crew and runs the gate to hell equipment rental place outside of Dortmund in Germany told me that there's people who are either immigrants or suspected like left wingers and stuff who've had the crap beat out of them in broad daylight, right in downtown Dortmund in the middle of the day. Hmm. That part's not getting on the news over here, but that's how scary these people are. 
And uh, then, you know, even worse, go to the Philippines. Trump oh, yeah. wants to have a big old state dinner for Rodrigo Duterte. Maybe he still needs to hit the 20,000 mark in uh, extrajudicial killings by homegrown ragtag death squads who suddenly decided they're mad at their neighbors, so they're going to kill him and tell the government he was a drug dealer. Oh, good, fine, go kill another one. And, of course, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who in some ways may be a bigger menace to the entire world than Trump is. Trump is the biggest threat to world peace. Bolsonaro is the biggest threat to any hope of somehow turning the tide against not climate change. Let's admit it, it's climate collapse. Collapse. All because you know, the, the Amazon over. is just burning to death right now. Yeah, And it, it's all Satan's comb over. Hmm. And it's all, I think, coordinated by super wealthy, super right-wing people and corporations. We've had enough of this Occupy stuff. We've had enough of this $15 an hour for working at McDonald's and Black Lives Matter and its predecessors. It's time to put down the boot and crush these people, especially... Hmm. Because now that the economy is changing much faster than even we, your lovely fascist overlords, thought it would, there's going to be more and more people who have no hope of ever finding work. We could just all have a guaranteed income, like not just Martin Luther King, but even Richard Nixon was toying with the idea of that at one point. I think, what's his name? Yang, who uh, was running for president, he was all about guaranteed income. So at least he got it into the into some of the de debates and discussions as into the conversation, you know, that's part yeah. of the reason you do that even if you know it's not going to happen not right away you know and that was how i geared my platform when i kind of had a running for president dropped in my lap unexpectedly in 2000 was okay i'm going to operate on two tracks especially because i'm going to complain for who knows how many hours of a spoken word show there has to be some kind of you know, ideas at the end of the tunnel. It's not just a magic light, but two tracks, go in two tracks. What I think should be done, you know, like taxing the rich of 100% of their income, but, and what I think can actually be done. Two different tracks and push them at the same time. I mean, I'm for direct action, nonviolent direct action. Thank you, John Lewis, among others. And uh, an insurrection in the streets, in the voting booth, and with who we give our money to all at once. Hmm. Yeah, and, and all of the above approach. And, and what you say about advocating for certain things, even if you don't think they're immediately possible, I mean, that's exactly what the right does. And it attracts people. It attracts people who want the things that they're pushing. You know, you don't see corporate Democrats sort of pushing or looking toward the future. Whenever you're talking with someone like Nancy Pelosi, it's always about what is the possibility of passing a certain no, thing. And anything she, that any, any anything that can't pass muster with corporate Democrats and Republicans isn't even in the discussion and isn't is not is not even to be oh, considered. And, Meanwhile, and Republicans prior to that, district. how many times I, did they try to repeal Obamacare, even though there was no possibility of it even happening but i mean how many dozens of times did they attempt to do it on the floor even with it not being a possibility well i mean you're really touching a raw nerve with pelosi yeah. she quote unquote represents my district <laughs> but she sure as hell doesn't represent me hmm. and i have toyed for years with the idea of possibly running against her as a green, but I also realized I'd have to give up music and everything else and really actually do the door to door work and everything else and put a couple of years into it, even if I only got 5% of the vote, although I think I'd get considerably more. Hmm. But, um, and even if it was a st satirical campaign, yeah, I mean, my campaign for mayor in 79 for said mayor of San Francisco was largely intended as a prank. Hmm. which is a little bit different than a joke, a prank. Pranks can be very constructive. Just ask those TikTok kids who sabotaged Trump's rally. Oh, in, in, internet pranks are I, very I'm productive. I'm so proud of them. I admire them so much. That was so cool. <laughs> but one of the first ideas that popped into my head at the Pierre Ubu show where I mouthed off and started telling people I was running for mayor because our drummer, Ted, had dared me to do it when I was in the back of his car going to the Pirubu show. I, it, you know, I just, it's sort of like come up with, float out wild ideas and then figure out how to flesh it in later, like 
kill the poor or dead Kennedys or uh, something like that. Um, and uh, the lighter side of global terrorism and there's a song like that uh, in, in the Melvin's album. But the second idea that popped into my head, writing it in bleeding black felt tip pen I borrowed on a napkin at the Pierre Ubu show, wait a minute. We've got a really bad police brutality problem in this town. They want to be the LAPD and punks, gays, Latinos, labeled cholos, people of color, their favorite co- targets, and they're just running amok because Mayor Feinstein eggs them on. And so why not make police an elective office? You want to be a police officer? You run every four years for a new term voted on by the district you patrol. Mm -hmm. which also means instead of fucking off and living in Simi Valley or Novato where the big city where you have to police people is the enemy and so are the people there, you got to live in the hood. It's community policing overnight. And you'd have a lot less violence, a lot less corruption, and what do you want to bet a hell of a lot less crime, too? Mm -hmm. Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, has proposed that you have to have a license to be a police officer Her point being that, you know, if I get a manicure, the manicurist has to have a license. Taxi drivers have to have a license. Why shouldn't there be a license to be a cop? I mean, especially considering, especially considering what's at stake. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, God, somehow if I can ever get this to Mayor Lightfoot, there's a second part of that. Cops should be elected. So and it's not uh, as though the, the, the biggest bully on the block would always win. You know, it's like you, you present your credentials. Look, I, I have gone to police officer training or I've already been this. I'm running for lieutenant now and I know how this is done. You know me. I'm in the neighborhood. You know, nobody runs for county coroner who doesn't have some experience with corpses. That's true. <laughs> Let me uh, ask you. Another question about timelessness is I was listening to kind of the new record and thinking about your content and, you know, thinking about kind of the the way it reflects on the state of things and and things to come. Uh, One more thing that kind of struck me as uh, timeless just about the sound of the record was um, was the voice. I mean, after all these years, like the volume, (laughs) the tone, the trademark aggressive vibrato is like still there in full force um it's it sounds and you've like i'm out from under the bed now well you, you I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying vocally you have not skipped a beat in a couple of decades and i'm just wondering if there's any <laughs> sort of secret to it or anything in terms of like vocal maintenance well, because i mean in, you in, 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 ter- in, ter- in terms of the grander I- scheme of punk music you're not an orthodox vocalist, you know what I mean, and and uh, I I, I'm, I'm just sort of I'm just sort of wondering, like, what you know, what 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 is what is the key? Are you, are you just kind of a special case, or are you doing something to kind of keep it at at the state that it um, is? You just froze. Oh, am I back? Well, um, I mean, my style kind of evolved through Walter Mitty and Cinderella, even before punk really hit. Well, we like, should maybe I could at least sing in a band somewhere, maybe cover some songs by deep purple or something and Mm. you know even practice some of that so i could hit the high notes in child and time as i was walking to school and then i got this pizza delivery job after i left high school a semester early because i had all my credits so i just left never went to graduation either but i got the piece of paper of course and um got a job delivering pizzas and so a lot of time alone in the car, my hippie day, smoke a lot of weed, getting tipped with more weed. And, uh, but also it occurred to me, I mean, I, I always was good at imitating my teachers and Nixon and Howard Cosell and others, um, you know, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, the whole thing. What would happen if I imitated people I liked and didn't necessarily want to make fun of? So I played around with singing voice, and before long, I had Eric Burden, who's always been one of my absolute favorites from the Mm -hmm. animals and beyond. He's still active, and if you get to go see him somewhere for crying out loud, do it. His voice is still there, and he will slay the room. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Eric Burden, I got Jim Morrison, I got Iggy, and worked on some Sky Saxon and Rocky Erickson, but he is so stratospherically... Hi, I couldn't really do him, let alone Arthur Brown. I had Robert Plant for a while, too, but then uh, all that weed burned up that top part of my throat. So <laughs> is music better off 
you decide. Again, I, I, I just find, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that your vocals have kind of maintained the power and the character that they have over the years that they have just really impressive. When, and when people right. do hear this new record, I think they're going to hear that instantaneously. Well, the um, sad part is I had to re-record some of those songs two or three times because oh. some of the vocals were so off key. Hmm. I began to wonder once again if I'd actually fucking lost it and stuff hmm. and got extremely crestfallen and depressed and that ties you in more knots when you try to do it again and stuff but i learned from the early tours my throat would blow out within two gigs oh no and the tour was like this and you know having to do all that stuff trying to be all awesome and tense on stage but there was my voice and stuff it even went out entirely after i crashed at somebody's place who had a german shepherd and the dog allergies hit, and suddenly I had absolutely no voice at all and didn't know it till I tried to sing the first line of the first song the next night in Houston. This was in New Orleans. Like, oh, shit. So eventually I caved in, and some good friends of ours from the Mutants pointed me to a voice teacher hmm. and said, no, she's not going to try and make you into an opera singer. She'll go with you, but, you know, we learned a lot from her we sing better we got a better range and we don't wear out as fast and her name's pat Wynn. and so i went to her in 85 and uh, that was when we were doing the frankenchrist songs recording that then we went out on the longest tour we ever went out on which was seven weeks with one little five day break about four four weeks in and my voice didn't blow till the second to the last show hmm after we'd done one kind of half outdoors and freezing temperatures in Phoenix the night before. So it worked, you know, I'd have to hide and do all these vocal warm ups where nobody heard me. You know, I tried just doing them in the dressing room before the very first show I was going to use on that. And Keith Morris was in the room too. Oh, that was a different set of vocal things. And so I was like, what are you doing that for dude? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I got to do this in private from now on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. And I'm then sure I on, learned I'm sure way the more punk, of them. I'm sure on the punk tour well, doing vocal warm ups is really uncool. Well, even Sturgeon from Leftover Crack does mm. vocal warm ups. Left which was some under, of the stuff he did with the high underrated raspy band. stuff he does. I can see why he feels like he has to if he's going to do that yeah. more than one night in a row mm. at all. I mean, Hank 3 eventually got a second person to do the Cookie Monster throaty vocals for Ass Jack mm. because doing that and everything else the same night, it was screwing up his country voice. Mm. So, uh, and I'm not sure he ever learned warm-ups. He may have, but, um, you know, there's some people I've seen who started out off-key and then found their voice halfway through the show, and I'm like, warm-ups would do so much good for these people. They'd hit it straight away. In one case, I can't tell him that because that was Rocky Erickson and we lost him. The whole Rocky Erickson voice was there halfway through the show, but not the first part. So basically, I've done Pat Wynn's longer version of the vocal warm-ups and even added or made up a, two, a few as I went along. She's a good friend, too. That didn't hurt. She'd never encountered anything like me before, and she kind of went with it. You know, I don't want to sing all high and smooth. You need to listen to James Brown. You need to listen to Little Richard. Now, I know you're not going to listen to The Birthday Party or Nick Cave, but blah, blah, blah. And instead of always going nothing but high, 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 some of them, I may be the only one who does this, but I think it's very helpful, especially when you want to get the diaphragm engaged, to do them lower and lower and lower, too, at least some of them, hmm. which helped me a lot. Now the diaphragm is automatic. So I both have the Brian Ferry trill, and that was my mom's one comment about the Sunshine song. He's singing wrong. So my mom's a big opera person and stuff. My oh. parents are classical music people, and uh, at least what they, they're listening, favorite stuff. Anyway, um, so but, but the involuntary one from below that you do get with the opera people and many others from Tom Jones on down, um, that, that, I have that too now although if i try to have one and then go to the other pulling one from the other is not easy next to impossible and oh. so um basically yeah i mean every time e even uh, for a while even before every gsm rehearsal to get my voice back i was going to pats and then going to the practice round hmm. and then i thought i had and i could just go to 
practice. Then I started working with her again before we recorded the new album. Then things started going south. And um, so uh, a lot of time with her <laughs> in the well, last year or more. But uh, it paid off. I mean, you're not the only person who's complimented those vocals to a degree I never expected. Although yeah. I am well aware that I do have a distinctive voice. And it's not something my songwriting style or styles and uh, going all over the map and widening the base of the punk pyramid and stuff. Um, even with New Orleans Raunch and Soul All-Stars or the Americana record I did with Mojo Nixon as part of it. Someday I want to do a garage psych one and a rockabilly one too, but we shall see. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's rare that but, somebody... But anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I was I was I was going to get into a new topic and, and just leave okay. it at saying uh, you know it's it's rare that somebody who has a voice as as uh, unique as yours is able to maintain it for the years that you have without some kind of you know practice or you know like uh, uh, it, I, I guess instruction or you know a voice coach or somebody like that so I'm, I'm well, not surprised people, to hear that but it's, they, you know, it's, they it's, tour it's, so much that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. It, uh, that's how they do it although remember the words of Willie Nelson too. What were Deep they? down, every singer is in love with their own voice. <laughs> so I, I want to ask you about... And that includes uh, Sturgeon. That includes probably even the people in Crass, what have you. That's... <laughs> Cal from Discharge, certainly. That's probably true. Uh, well, referring to that and the punk spirit, I wanted to ask you about that sort of in the abstract. I, I know there are a lot of old heads from you know, from years ago and even today you sort of bitch and complain about the genre not being what it used to be, which I think is ignorant on a few different levels. I mean, not really? only, yeah, not, not, not only because really? it, it, it ignores all the good, it ignores all the good bands out there right now, but simultaneously, do, do you feel like the spirit of the genre, the attitude and uh, sort of like the, 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 the fight against I guess, uh, the, the status quo, do you not think that that's simultaneously embodying itself in new music trends, other genres and creative media? Oh, it always has. Yeah. It always has. Hmm. The beats, the anti-Vietnam war, let's make a better future version of, you know, rock and psychedelia and folk and the blends of it all and stuff. Oscar Wilde. There's another one, little Richard. There's another one. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and some people would argue with that spirit was very much in Jesus Christ, too. Hmm. Oh, I we'll, don't know we'll how we'll many thank you for elucidating in, in, in our uh, our realm have ever declared themselves to be the son of God and meant it. I have no idea. But uh, I, I can think of a few who thought they were, but uh, hmm. some of them have died from drugs. Um. <laughs> but but that, that, that spirit you're talking about, I mean... I learned early on because it was such a hardcore hippie and then that got stale and I got depressed. Then punk happened. And one fine evening in my dorm room in my one quarter of college at UC Santa Cruz, I was blasting the sex pistols with my dorm door open to, to, to kind of annoy the entire hall on purpose. I whipped out a pair of scissors and cut off all my hippie hair and put it in a plastic bag and nailed it to the door of the dorm my dorm room and left it there the rest of the time I was there I found that bag a few years ago too I still have it somewhere oh Jesus you know Christ. I could sell it one little bit at a time or whatever I don't know That's you know there's idea. my DNA frame me for crimes <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh, it, but you know but then suddenly I felt dangerous again I was freaking people out it's just like being the first person in sixth grade to have long hair and now it's happening again what a great thing to do but but it was also the lesson from that was I was going to be the last diehard hippie on earth. Hmm. Then that wouldn't happen anymore. And I changed. Hmm. And so people who are like punk died when Darby crash died, or, you know, I like all these bands of eighties, but there's nothing good sense. And like too bad for you. You want new stuff. Put down the bottle, put down the needle, put down the powder, leave the apartment and start going to shows at random until somebody unexpectedly blows you away. And that might lead you to another one or another one. Or if that isn't the option, back we go to the discussion on surfing on the net, looking for new, cool, weird music. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of what sustained me is that I've always been such a fan 
too. You know, I, I, I'm so grateful I wasn't born with the addiction gene that killed and messed up so many of my friends, but I do have one, and it's called vinyl. Or more than that, music, shall we say. Mm. So, uh, you know, if I have to put up with something on CD or cassette or whatever, I don't do the band camp thing usually, but uh, there's only so much I can absorb anyway. Mm. And at the time, you know, the mm. only time I listen to demos is on disc in my car. Mm. Only time I got. So why don't you sit at the computer for the next hour looking for people on Bandcamp? I don't have time. I don't like to listen to music that way anyway. But the point being, I know there's so much out there that I haven't heard. And so many goddamn records I bought because I heard them in the store. I wanted to listen to them because I was curious. Hmm. They're still sitting in my house unlistened to. Hmm. That's on me. I mean, that's like Citizen Kane or Marcos or Michael Jackson bringing all that stuff home. I don't know. But at least you can put it on and there's sounds that come out. I mean, when I first moved to San Francisco and an extra five bucks was rare and whatnot, you really had to watch it. People didn't have any money, but you could still afford to live here. But you really had to be careful. The extra five bucks, I could spend it on speed like a lot of other people could did, or I could spend it on records. So, Tipper Gore, music did not lead me to drugs. It saved me from drugs. Because once you do the speed... And I couldn't handle it anyway. I had to admit to myself later, I just cracked up too much the next day. But with a record, you can play it and it's cool. And it makes it high anyway. If it's a good record, you got the adrenaline going, you got the brain spin going. And then instead of it all being gone till you go to the record dealer again, you can play it again and again. Much better addiction than substances. Thank you very much. What this also means is it never goes stale. Mm -hmm. Any music that I haven't heard before, even if it was recorded in 1910, is new to me because mm -hmm. I've never heard it before. So there's always new music out there for me to find, including entire genres I might not have known existed before. Mm -hmm. You know, no, I, I, I never get tired of that. It's I not just a fan. It's also, again, just not being afraid of my own curiosity. That's my addiction, too, and I completely identify with everything you just said. Uh, but uh, I, I want to open one more can of worms here. I wanted um, you to put weird records behind yourself, too. I'm, I'm you're sorry. I'm calling sorry. this thing needle drop. I'm sorry. With, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I don't sorry. even know what you're dropping needles on. Well, I'll, 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 I'll send you an email about it later. But. <laughs> But your listeners, inquiring fans of yours who pay your subscription fee want to know. I know it's five it's, it's records true. you've listened to in the last five days. I, I sometimes I do vinyl updates and I need to do a new one. But anyway, well, um, you know, which one to do. It's called Tea Party Revenge Porn. Yes. And that'll I'm sure that'll make it into Be one. the first reviewer on your block. Let me ask you uh, uh, again another can of worms or, or just sort of an assessment. Uh, I, I want to kind of remind everybody who isn't sort of familiar and doesn't know, you know, between your music and your spoken word work, uh, you were right on the money when it came to Reagan and the religious right of the eighties and sort of what would be born out of that from the neoliberalization of the democratic party in the nineties, uh, the draconian rollback of our civil liberties, of our civil liberties under the Bush administration and everything that came out of the war and on terror. And a senator named Joe Biden, I might add. That too. And then moving on from there to the ineffectiveness of the Obama administration and how that administration was harsher on immigrants, continued the foreign wars, simultaneously was happy to allow things like Occupy to be totally crushed. So considering that you have been on the money on the front lines, opinion-wise, on, on all of these things, and, and, and again, have sort of seen in what direction it was all going, assessed it accurately, and sort of, again, foretold pretty accurately what was going to come down the pipe from there. Uh, and, and for all things considered in your videos, too, you've made a lot of very fair assessments of Trump as well. So again, all of that being considered, like, where the fuck are we right now? Like, I mean, it was just a few hours ago, Trump came on the mic and, and said, like, we're just going to start throwing ballots away. Like, we're, we're, we're just going to be throwing the ballots away. And, and is there going to be a peaceful transfer of power? Uh, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Like, in, in, in your opinion, 
considering everything that you've said so far, everything that you've predicted and how accurate that's all been, like, is, is there any saving America at this point? I think John Lewis's concept of good trouble applies to all of us. Hmm. And I am a little more on the side of pranks and sabotage and stuff that John Lewis might not be thinking of. But, you know, there's anybody can pull pranks and, you know, even putting out of order signs on key pieces of equipment at work or uh, all kinds of other fun things, especially in the digital age. You know, that just, and part of that is just to keep your own dignity too. I mean, where would I be if it weren't for all the people I'm so grateful to who were ever interested in dead Kennedys, especially this long after the fact? I wanted the music to hold up this long. I kind of tried to lay it out and make sure the record sounded good. Spider Ray looking at his watch all the time. We got to mix another song and everything, but so that it would last. You know, I identified with cult figures. You know, Iggy, MC5, Zappa, Beefheart, and knew that they might not be rolling in dough, but they were making a living off their art and sustaining themselves by being themselves. You know, one hit tuppity doo pop single and you're gone sometimes. Why bother? Hmm. You know, so I, I, I learned from that. And I'm very grateful that people still are interested in my stuff, even just the past stuff, but for crying out loud, if you like dead Kennedys, you just might like Guantanamo School of Medicine too, hmm. you know? And you know, what are you gonna go back and play with them? Probably never because they all act so much like Trump, but uh, you know, but there's all this new music. You might wanna check that out. And um, so, yeah, very grateful to that. And, um, but it also means, I mean, we are indeed looking at you know, what they're hoping is the final act of a corporate coup that's been going on slowly but surely like a small, slow moving tank, at least since Reagan, hmm. possibly even since Carter, who steered the Democratic Party more in a conservative and corporate direction, much more than people realize today, because what came afterwards was so bad, while Carter has been such an exemplary former president. You know, obviously, a lot of these people, their fantasies go back earlier to Nixon and Goldwater and a group called the Young Americans for Freedom, which, unlike the Yippies or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or the Panthers or whatever, mm -hmm. because they were right wing radicals, there was no end of rich people ready to pay for them and introduce them to the right people, get them jobs in the White House, get them into office later. A lot of these people trace back to YAF or, yeah. No, YFF and um, the Nixon White House and stuff, even the Manafort types and stuff go back into this too. Hmm. And um, Roger Stone, of course, and Dick Cheney and Karl Rove. And uh, I don't know where William Barr came from. I think he's that old too. But I mean, part of what we're dealing with now is a lot of the old, really, really fanatical hardliners from the Nixon regime who thought Nixon was too wimpy. And then a younger group of hardliners who looked up to them, but also thought even George W. Bush was too wimpy. And all that stuff, they should have gone far, they should have put more protesters in prison, torture more people, et cetera. But they don't get put out on the street as those damn Occupy radicals or whatever. They get money and they get power and they get very cushy, cushy jobs, either in government, or in media, or flipping back and forth and stuff. Roger Ailes goes way back with Nixon, too. He was Nixon's TV guy in 1968. He just approached him and said, you're not good at television. I can help you. And unfortunately for the world, he did. Hmm. But uh, so now what we have is all these people who have been that bitter since then that Nixon got run out of town on a rail for Watergate not just because they thought Nixon was this great guy and loved all the horrible things he was doing, but you may recall Nixon later kind of shocked everybody when he was being interviewed by this guy. It wasn't it? Yeah, it was David Frost, a British guy who came over, the Frost and Nixon movie, where he finally blurted right out, when the president breaks the law, it is not a crime. Mm -hmm. And that's what these people believe. I mean, both William Barr and Brett Kavanaugh have written legal papers 
saying that the president is above the law and must be above the law because any investigation of any kind while this person is in office is distracting to their difficult job. Therefore, it should be illegal to investigate the president until out, they're out of office and not even go after him for stuff they did before they were in office, which is very important with Trump, because if the law was really in force, he might well be on death row for treason because of some of that you know, colluding with foreign powers and all that good stuff. So these people are absolutely fanatical of finally cementing in place that the president is above the law, even if it means stealing elections and even if it means burning ballots, burning the Bundestag like the Hitler people did and whatnot, shooting people or, you know, you know there's going to be all these people with big ass guns and probably masks for the wrong reasons and Confederate flags and make America great again out of their gigantic pickup trucks, like the one that ran the protesters in Portland. There was something like 150 trucks behind that one. That was a lot of people. These, and like the seizure of the Michigan Capitol building by those same gun nuts who came in from out of state and were financed in part by Betsy DeVos and thus Eric Prince's family, hmm. Mr. Blackwater, those are dry runs. Those are dry runs for what they want to do everywhere where people who might vote the wrong way or look the wrong way might show up to vote. I mean, a lot of places in the Deep South, you just see those guys sitting there. Even if they're parked a block away, you turn around and you don't vote because you have too many horrible PSTSD memories. That's going to be stirring up and stuff. And I'm not just talking about people old enough to remember lynchings. Because lynchings are back in vogue, in part thanks to Trump. You know, Ahmaud Arbery was lynched. George hmm. Floyd was lynched. Hmm. Breonna Taylor was lynched. And they just let the cops off today for that, although federal civil rights crimes were still violated, which will not be investigated by Attorney General Barr. But there's a trickle of a chance it would be if Biden actually got in. But that's what we're looking at is an attempt to put the final boot down that the president is above the law and only one kind of president is acceptable. And now that we've had all these decades and everybody's gotten so corrupt, imagine my heartbreak after seeing Nixon get run out of town on a rail, he stopped the Vietnam War, got rid of Tricky Dick, feeling pretty good, and then the 70s kind of got worse and worse. Then the 80s got just plain evil under Reagan. You know, greed is good, where the music was the only good thing about the 80s, at least the underground music, and, um, and then on down to where we are now. And, and like now, and when did, when did I first say this on a spoken word album? Early 90s, even before that? You know, instead of one Nixon, now both parties and every level of government are one big army of Nixons. Hmm. And there's no better example of that than Biden, I might add. I mean, obviously, the Trump sees are even worse. But um, this is what we're up against. And part of the reason Obama didn't really get a whole lot done. Well, number one, he was a great speech of fire, but a very poor leader. Very poor at actual leadership. To the point where, and, and Pelosi is to blame for this too, they didn't go whole hog about getting rid of Bush's tax cuts for the rich, which were really unpopular and were going to come up for renewal in December of 2010. And they kept silent about it before November 2010. And we all know what happened there and yeah. stuff. You know, all these people were cocked and loaded because they knew Citizens United was going to go down. They even you know, took over state legislatures and you know the rest got to redraw all the district and gerrymandering. It hasn't been this bad since maybe even before the Civil War. I don't know. And they're trying to make it worse now. So I'm not sure exactly how each local area can fight this. I mean, if it means walking a nonviolent escort protection to get people into the voting booth because there's gun nuts sitting on the corner in their pickup truck who know the cops are going to pat them on the head, just like they did Kyle Rittenhouse in, uh, in Kenosha. Hey, I just killed somebody. Okay, go on, fine. What the fuck was that? Chris Rock, what is up with that? That's how you question that. And I've never understood why, if there's certain kinds of IDs they want to let you vote, and it's targeted to make sure 
people of color and older people, younger people don't have those kind of IDs, then why isn't there more of an effort by organized voting groups, the black church, others, to just get people the right kind of IDs? Oh, you can't vote. You're black. No, no, no. Look at the ID I now have. Let me in. Mm -hmm. So, oh, the line's too long. we got to lock the doors now. I'm worried about that one. I mean, yeah. that's how W stole the second election he was in in 2004. He didn't. They say he won the popular vote, and he did, because Ohio and Florida were rigged again. Mm -hmm. and possibly Louisiana and Arkansas and more as well. Well, thanks for trying to, you know, at, at least paint a picture of what we're up against. It's, you know, you're so packed with knowledge on a lot of this stuff that uh, it's, it's good you know, to hear it all. I don't know what they're going to do yeah. about the Biden problem. Yeah. You know, he comes across more like a coelacanth than a person, if you know what a coelacanth is. <laughs> you know, the so-called living fossil, that withered, weird-looking fish they caught on a line way deep in the sea off of the island of Madagascar and realized they thought this fish was extinct millions of years ago. And every once in a while, another one comes up and stuff, the living fossil. It's spelled like coelacanth, C O E. L A C A N T H. They pronounce it silicon, and uh, that's what Biden is. He's the silicon. You know, honestly, I don't, I don't know if there's much of an explanation but, for it outside of like, it, it's it's like watching a Harlem Globe a Globe Trotters game. Honestly, like watching the Republicans just dribble around the Democrats and watch them pick like the worst candidate that they have in front of them. It's like, oh yeah, this well, this will work. Do? I mean, you'd, get, yeah. you'd get more Biden if he was out there doing the same kind of rallies Trump is. Yeah, but Trump is literally murdering his own cult following every time he goes out because of all the people who are so proud they ain't wearing those masks. The only MAGA masks you're seeing, which look remarkably like fangs. And sharp, you know, crocodile teeth and stuff. And that's probably intentional, um, just like those mouths on the bombers in World War II. Hmm. Um, there's been spikes in coronavirus everywhere there's there been. There has, a but the thing is, rally. like, the Electoral College and, almost makes And they're that. also scared half to death that Biden is going to get it if he goes out too much. No, I know. And but the, th but the thing is, like, even, 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 if, even if he's getting. More, but even if how he's you getting counter people, that, I don't know hmm. yet. Even if he's getting people in his crowd sick, the electoral college, college almost makes that a non-factor because as long as he wins that state, it doesn't matter if uh, so many thousands of people sort of in that state dies, as long as that state stays red, essentially. And if, you know, they've gerrymandered well, it to death. Here, here's you know, what it's, we it's, have it's, to it's prepare sort of for. A, it's, it's not so much of a factor. Here's what we have to prepare for. Hmm. As far as the Supreme Court goes in three words, we are fucked. Hmm. And so... We have to start pushing, and if the, Biden actually gets in, you need a real blowtorch up his ass the whole time to get anything done here, and that applies to Harris, too. I mean, she's from the same San Francisco machine that gave us Feinstein and Pelosi and Willie Brown and Gavin Newscom and every single mayor we've had since I've been here to make sure nobody goes after PG&E. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, not just that, yes... We do need to debate adding more justices to the Supreme Court, which does not require a constitutional amendment. Congress votes on that, which mm -hmm. makes it all the more important that if you get a majority and McConnell can't run the place anymore, you abolish the filibuster, which should have been abolished, oh, well before the Civil Rights Act was held up for months by filibusters in the 1964 and stuff. That should have been the first clue. Why do you even have that, you mm -hmm. know? And so it's time to get rid of that once and for all because it gets too abused. And that's why even when um, Harry Reid was running the Senate and they had both houses and Obama was in his first two years, practically nothing got done, not just because of poor leadership from the top, but because McConnell is such a diabolical master of all the weird rules that only happen in the Senate that he could try and filibuster all these things, whether people had done that in the past or not. Well, it's not tradition. I don't care. And, uh, you know, it would, bl would block everything unless he could get 60 votes. And there were enough n other, like, right-wing extremists in there, and old-school segregationists like McConnell is, that you, it, it was hard to get 60 votes on anything. Mm -hmm. And McConnell already said, even 
before Trump stole the election in 2016, you know, the real vote fraud, um, that if Hillary won, he was going to make sure that no court nominees got a hearing for the next four years. Hmm. But there's another way to counter that, and it always drives me nuts when the people at the top of the Democratic ticket don't do this, is when um, there, it's always about, and especially with the conventions, even the virtual one, me, 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 president, 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 president. Wrong. It matters just as much who your senators are, mm -hmm. who your Congress creatures are, who is the governor on down to, who's on the city council and decides whether money goes to homeless housing or a stadium or a golf course. Who's on the school board, fundamentalist Christians or people who want to educate? This stuff and, and those ballot initiatives, read them, vote intelligently on them, because that's where we can have a direct say. And when we do, we get decriminalization of cannabis and rent control. And when we don't, we get three strikes, you're out, and really vicious attacks on migrants hmm. and stuff. So, um, and anti-gay amendments too, I might add. I don't think those would win anymore, but they did their damage, obviously. I don't you know if, 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 if we get another four years, if we get to, another four years of Trump, though, I think those kinds of amendments would win. They won't win if they're calling the shots and they have all the guns. Hmm. And that's a key part. Like, yeah, well, maybe we should get our own militias going. A black militia has shown up in Louisville about the worst possible thing you could have happen in a way. Hmm. And, oh, we thought somebody fired a shot over there. So therefore we shot 10 protesters. You know, this you really you're not just playing with fire. You're playing with the uh, bombs the size of Timothy McVeigh's when you do this kind of stuff. But anyway, back to the president. Me, 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 me. Clinton, second term. Gingrich and the Nutsies had taken over the house and were wrecking everything. And um, you know, the guy even looked like a pig. He was bigoted as hell, talking about trying to put. Um, you know, ch children of poor people, meaning African-Americans in orphanages. And that got seriously discussed at the time and stuff. And, but there is Clinton. You know he's going to crush Bob Dole. Everybody knew it. But he's all about me, 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 when he could be saying, I can't get anything done unless we get the House back and keep the Senate support who's running here and mention their names when they're in their state support a bunch of them who are in trouble and mention their names at the convention they never do that john Kerry didn't do it al gore didn't do it obama didn't even do it and he had pretty nice coattails at least for a little while hmm. and luckily somebody up there knew enough to let occupy stick around for a while until winter hit because obama owed his whole second term to occupy whether he will ever admit it or not. You know, that was not a pro-Obama vote in 2012. Hmm. That was an anti-Romney vote. No, it was. You combine Occupy vaulting inequality from something that the corporate McNews networks don't want to talk about at all to front and center, and it has to be talked about. At the same time, another patriotic prankster recorded Romney without his permission at that little gathering in Florida, just put his phone up where they wouldn't see it, talking about how 47% of the country, well, a bunch of freeloaders, they'll never vote for us. They think they're entitled to health care. They mm. think they're entitled to food. Romney said that. People think he's this moderate now just because he's kind of anti-Trump. Moderate Mo Romney was really nasty. Yeah, Remember no, he we was. wanted he, Paul he, Ryan, on, on who was that, a uh... downright sadist, to on be his vice president. On that, so on that back room sort of recording, he was like quite nasty. And then he just sort of flipped on the uh, Supreme Court thing, even though, again, people are thinking, oh, well, he's anti-Trump. I'm not surprised. Thing is, no, I'm not surprised Romney either. The thing is, at the end of the day, these Republicans, all they don't like about Trump are the tweets. Everything I mean, else he is had, fine. He, he had his eye on running this year, and then he didn't have an opening, hmm. as did Governor Sick, excuse me, Kasich from Ohio. Hmm. Ryan was looking at it. Walker, also in Wisconsin, had their eye on it. Hmm. Tom Cotton, who's the really far-right extremist and stuff. You know, George Wallace, only worse, that senator out of Arkansas. He's already running ads down there for him for 2024. Hmm. 
All right, let me, uh, let, let, let me let me let me throw anyway, one more but, thing. But go back to the me 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 me. Well, well, well let, let me move on. Late. Let me move on to another topic entirely because I I feel, I feel like you kind not of yet. You know, explore. not yet. No, okay. I'm going to finish with this one, but we haven't right, finished. Finish it. Blowtorch under Biden and Harris and that whole crew. Now hmm. you need to be out there more, and you need to be going to bat for other people running for office. Hmm. It's not a done deal that McGrath, who's a mealy mouth corporate Democrat, is going to lose to McConnell in Kentucky. The other guy who came out at the last minute, the African-American legislator, hmm. he probably, if he'd gotten in, uh, gotten the nomination, he's probably a better opponent for McConnell. But Amy McGrath is what you got, a conservative ex-fighter pilot Democrat, but that's better than McConnell. But they should be going to bat for her and people like that. Make sure Gardner goes down in Colorado. Make sure McSally goes down in Arizona and several others. And it's not a done deal that Doug Jones, who's a pretty conservative Democrat who might even vote for Amy Coney Barrett or something, thinking mm. it'll save his own seat mm. in Alabama, you can guarantee you that the ex-football coach who, who knocked off Jeff Sessions is going to be worse. So the more they put emphasis on this is the reason to vote, I mean, that was part of the way I hooked up with Punk Voter in 2004. It was all like Howard Dean, John Kerry, and that was where Fight Fat Mike was at. I was like, no, we need a Green Party presence here. And we also need somebody like me, if you're gonna, not going to do it, saying the main reason to vote, even if it's nothing but evil cartoon characters at the top and corporate puppets, is the local elections. Get smart. Vote smart and do it for life. Michael Moore agrees with that emphatically. All right. Now another question. All right. The last thing I wanted to ask you about the last can of worms uh, conceptually is cancel culture. You were in a way canceled in a way that was very well, for, overt. Forget back yeah, yeah. in the day. Well, 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 well I, hold, hold, hold on. Before you go on. Before you. Before you go on. Before you go on. Before you. Before you. Don't please. Please slow down the train. Slow down the train. Slow down the Jello train. I am referring very specifically to, and you already know this the Frankenchrist trial, where you were canceled in a way very overtly, oppressively, and systematically. I wasn't canceled. I'm still here. Well, no, you're still here, and obviously. And so is the Frankenchrist but, 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 the, but, the thing, but the thing is, it was an attempt, which I, think, which I think pales in comparison today to people just getting mad on the internet about something, and people are sort of bitching about their free speech being restricted as a result of that, when it's not even close to that. When, again, in your experience, you actually suffered, you know, sort of like a prosecution quite literally, in, in a way that was uh, uh, almost destructive to your life and your livelihood and your ability to continue your career at the time. And I was sort of wondering, like, you know, in, in your perspective, like, you know, what has sort of been more harrowing and, and more upsetting to your would be, you know, hypothetically, like, you know, that trial, that experience, that, that sort of like takedown of you in a way or an attempt to do so, or if a bunch of people were, I don't know, angry on Twitter about how an old Dead Kennedys lyric read or something. Um, I don't keep up with people talking shit about me on Twitter or farce book or any of that. I mean, I learned that early with all the, 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 the little shop talk bickering that goes on to this day hmm. in the pages or the digital pages of maximum rock and roll. Hmm. And then I saw it again with the uh, growing pains of the green party. Hmm. There was a lot of sometimes personal stuff behind it, kind of bickering that I'm like, okay, I learned early on, I'm never going to please everybody, so why am I going to try? Hmm. I am not going to be worried about being liked by people who it's very possible if I met them, I wouldn't like them. You know, and I also was playing the long game with people from everybody from Ben Weasel to other people claiming I was this big sellout and this, that, and the other. Hmm. Okay, let's see where you are in five years. Hmm. Because even though I'm not as more radical than thou as parts of the crass doctrine or MDC or some of the propaganda or some of the later ones, I've tried to stake out a position and a lifestyle I can live with and live up to. Hmm. It's not easy. I try as hard as I can to go as far as I can and do as much damage as I can without being a jerk about it. And it's an ongoing adventure because times change and people change. And of course, that means events change. But um, so now we have 
Number one, we have to remind ourselves just because corporate media has put out the phrase cancel culture doesn't mean we have to go around parroting it. Anti-abortion zealots who are even willing to kill and blow up clinics to make their point should never have been called pro-life. Hmm. They can call themselves pro-life. That doesn't mean we have to call them pro-life. I mean, even now, even the supposed, you know, pinnacle of lefty journalism on mainstream news, you know, Rachel Maddow, she still answers to Comcast. And I still cringe when it comes out of her mouth or any of the others. When Donald Trump was elected in 2016, he was not elected. The election was stolen. He lost the popular vote. The more accurate way to say it is the Trump regime seized power. Seized power, not elected. Never elected. Don't fall for this stuff. There is no such thing as an industrial park. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as clean coal and things like that. Just don't parrot that stuff. Mm -hmm. So then, because cancel culture, it doesn't really mean you're canceled necessarily. I first saw that being thrown around a lot because somebody at some school invited Ivanka Trump, of all people, to do, what was it, their graduation ceremony and stuff. Other people complained to the point where she either took herself out or they canceled her. But it's more complicated than that because you know just any school you care to name, including a conservative Southern school or something like George Mason University or something, if they invited her to give the commencement address, there would be pushback because that person is completely unqualified. And in all likelihood, whoever decided to invite her was one committee, the lecture board, the events committee, whatever, with a handful of students on it who did not ask the other 20, 30, 40,000 students for their input at all. I mean, there's such a battle to get people on those committees, and it's done quietly. I mean, this is, again, where the extreme right and the corporate right are so much more organized than we are. They groom people. I mean, Ted Cruz and Paul Ryan were identified in middle school as really bright, really fanatical right-wing people. Let's groom them, introduce them to the right people, get them into the right schools, get them going. That's how organized they are, which mm -hmm. also means a lot of these people... You know, when they're college freshmen, upper class people will find them. Yeah, you should get on this committee. Here, we got you a slot here because the more of us are on this committee, there's less of everybody else. And we can book one conservative speaker after another and nobody else, hmm. which meant for people like me, the college lecture circuit for my spoken word shows has largely dried up. Hmm. And that's a major reason. I mean, a sad one was, was I did a a thing at Guilford College, and I think it's what, Greensboro, North Carolina? Um, yeah, it's Greensboro. And the people tell me, yeah, you're the last speaker we're going to have for a long, long time. We're never going to have money for a long time. I'm like, God, I'm sorry. What happened? Maybe we can do something. Go, no, it's not you. Other people on another committee invited Colin Powell to speak and are paying him 50 grand for a 45-minute lecture on charitable giving which obviously was a hell of a lot more than they were paying me and stuff. So that's how political, I, at one point, there was a battle at UMass when I was there where I got canceled and then there was blowback and they had to bring me back because the nation of Islam took over the events board because mm -hmm. other people weren't organized enough to run over people, get other on there. And then they said, okay, we're canceling all these speakers, and we will have nothing but events acceptable to the Nation of Islam. Okay. That doesn't speak for a majority of anybody. Hmm. You know, I bet there's even hardcore members of the Nation of Islam who would like to hear other people and other things, too, and stuff. So let's get rid of the cancel culture concept hmm. and point out Ivanka Trump was legitimately yanked for that. Hmm. And people like that. You know, you know, you, you can't you, if, if you just sneak behind everybody's back and invite like Steve Bannon or Shapiro or one or Ann Coulter when you and your 10 friends got on the committee and you're the only ones who want them there. Yeah, there should be pushback on that. Sure. Definitely. That's not cancel culture. That is 
cultural freedom and freedom of speech. And in the case of fascists who want to take away our freedom of speech and possibly even our freedom in general, um, it's self-defense in a case like that. On the other hand, what you're getting at, I think, from the other side, I hear that too. And the only people who tried to pull that on me early on Hmm. was University of Texas, who said that I had to submit every word I was going to say to the school in advance. Hmm. And my reply was, that is infringement on my right to speak. I'm canceling unless you unless you waive that requirement, and they did, and look, which is also good because a lot of spoken word shows post nine one one were all off of bullet points, and I never wrote them down and stuff. I just kind of riffed on things, so that was something I wasn't going to do anyway. And then another example in 1992 was to the utter horror of those of us who had fought the man's wife for trying to take away our our freedom of speech, and then played the racial card when political hip hop like Public Enemy and Ice-T and NWA came on the scene, Tipper Gore's husband was picked by Bill Clinton to be his vice president. Hmm. Just about the worst person we could think of, this side of Dianne Feinstein or Joseph Lieberman, Hmm. as far as conservative Democrats who were nasty. Yeah, Lieberman's from my home state. Yeah, yes. You know that even before he got into the Senate, he had a reputation for being the most corrupt guy in the legislature and stuff. Yeah, he's a total sleaze. Anyway, um, and picking Lieberman had a lot more to do with Gore losing the 2000 election than Ralph Nader or my Green Party could ever hope to. Although another big reason that cost him that election was his wife. Hmm. So we rewind back to 1992. Well, although even in 2000, all I had to do was mention Tipper Gore's name to an audience of people largely younger than when the PMRC's hearings happened and stuff, but had that Tipper sticker on some of their music, they just boo and hiss immediately. They all knew who she was and what she was, and that she was a front for the religious right. I mean, her partner in the PMRC, the main one, was Susan Baker, wife of Secretary of State slash gangster James Baker, Hmm. and she was on the board of directors of Focus on the Family. Hmm. J- James, James, ba- James Baker, the, t- on the, the, TV preacher? The... the TV What's preacher, the TV preacher, James Baker. No, it, he, that's mainly radio and probably internet. That's James Dobson. Oh, okay, okay. He's not a preacher. He's a. Oh no, I'm, pre- no, I'm, I'm really thinking of, I'm thinking, of a dude, I'm thinking of a dude named Jim Baker. Sorry. And he, no, and he, no, and Jim and he, Baker. And he, se- so and he sells much. these like slot buckets where it's just like it, it's it's just like reconstitution meals, and it's just like big giant white buckets of oh, you know, yeah. like sloppy Joe stuff. And desperate you know, so people do desperate. He was also selling selling what he claimed was was water with a little bit of silver in it, and that would make you immune from COVID nineteen. <clears throat> oh, and wonderful. even the Trump regime made him stop. <laughs> but that's that's a sideshow. That's yeah. a sideshow. Baker was not as overtly into polit- after political power as much as Falwell and swaggered on down to what we have now, hmm. such as Mike Pence and all his friends. Hmm. You know, don't you, that Secretary of Health Azar and that guy with a little beard running the CDC and some of the others were all handpicked by Mike Pence among his religious right friends in Indiana. Hmm. Great. You have to factor in the fundamentalist. I believe in the end times. Maybe this is just the plague of locusts. You know, the guy Trump put in now, that Dr. Atlas, is all about herd immunity, which they calculate may kill as many people as Hitler killed Jews, if that goes through. Yeah. But anyway, back to 1992, that election, we were horrified that Gore got picked, although not surprised, Mm. because Clinton was a little bit like George Wallace in some ways. I was never going to vote for him. I have a conscience. You know, luckily I live in a state where I can vote for what I want and not get it. I'd much rather do that than vote for something I don't want and get it. Hmm. But anyway, um, so then there was the College Music Journal Convention, another, yet another panel on censorship of music because Gore got picked and it was going to get nasty and stuff, or so we feared. Lieberman had kind of taken the torch. No, he didn't do that till late. He didn't do that till, say, Columbine massacre. A little before that, we tried from the floor of the Senate to blame it on Marilyn Manson. We have to put this guy away and get rid of him. And those guys weren't even Manson fans. But yeah. Lieberman had his agenda. But, and McConnell started out getting his name in the paper by wanting to censor music, too. Mm. Yeah. 
And he, that's when I first heard of that guy. Like the minute they're on my radar screen, I remember these things. Hmm. I have a really good memory for trivia for music and white collar crime. <laughs> you know, Nixon criminals popping up with Reagan, Contragate criminals, bigger jobs with W. Oh, that person, they're back and whatnot. But anyway, back to this College Music Journal panel, mm -hmm. those kind of panels discussing censorship, I insist on somebody from the religious right being on there too, to be represented, because nobody believes me otherwise when I tell people how absurd these people are, mm -hmm. even now. And for that one, they had a guy named Brent Bozell who was second generation attack abortion clinics and stuff like that. And they got Bazell. And he went on some of these things, well, as a Catholic, this offends me. As a Catholic, we can't have that. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. There are parts of the Catholic Church and Catholic doctrine really offend me, too. And nor should I have to cater everything I make just out of fear of offending somebody who's so extreme fundamentalist Orthodox Catholic, he makes William Barr and Amy Coney Barrett look nice by comparison. Mm. But this guy seriously thought that because as a Catholic it offended him, we should cater all culture to make sure it doesn't offend Catholics. Even Jesse Jackson, who in some ways was badly damaged by the black church and said once called rock and roll child abuse. And that was when he was running for president. He tried to launch a talk show that didn't go very far. And he lectured iced tea on the air on why he should make sure that all his lyrics are suitable for parents. And that'll bring families closer together. Mm. Uh, Jesse, I love many things you've done, but there's other things I can't support you on. And um, so that, that was the same thing. You might be calling it cancel culture or something else. And yeah, it's crept in further and further into academic academia, both from the religious right and the far right and from hardliners on the other side, sometimes targeting the same people. There was a professor at University of Colorado in Boulder, where I'm from, who was teaching a class in order to educate people about what the life of a sex worker selling their body really is, was having people in the class come up and reenact trying to turn a trick or something, trying to figure out how to do it and stuff like that. And I don't know whether the religious right or the right wing side of the feminist cause pounced first. But the long and the short of it is that teacher doesn't have a job at CU anymore. Hmm. That shouldn't have happened. Not for that reason anyway. The Ward Churchill one is a little more complicated because they finally got him on plagiarism. Mm. But um, that kind of stuff is also like where you even say from Chris Rock on down to smaller comedians we haven't necessarily heard of whose bread and butter is touring on a punk rock le level, probably driving themselves all over the country to be the entertainment during lunch hour in the quad or the cafeteria or something you know there's a whole circuit of that too where people kind of eke out a living as a comedian or something and they were starting to get hit with we want the text of everything you're going to say in advance and we want to make sure it doesn't offend any people of color or trigger a mi or microaggression trigger here microaggression trigger there microaggression trigger there and the smaller comedian interview saying i can't work anymore I can't get gigs anymore because of one word, one place would offend one person. That's a problem. And Chris Rock came out and said, a interview, I just don't do colleges anymore because I'm not putting up with this. You know, you know that, that would mean most of my content would be erased because it's going to offend somebody. And yeah, a lot of humor is offensive and it's intended to offend people who in some cases are offending me or us and need to be made fun of. A lot better than violence, right? And uh, so, um, yeah. So what do you do? But you don't want to ban humor. And one way I look at it is, okay, what is funny, what is not? Mm. That's in the eye of the beholder, but the closest it can be for me when the oppressor makes fun of the oppressed, like Trump making fun of a disabled person or something, that's not humor, that's bigotry, and it sucks. 
But the oppressed making fun of the oppressor, that's fair game. You get from me what you're going to get. And if that pokes you and strikes a raw nerve, too bad. I'm willing to listen. I am willing to learn. You know, I got kind of talked into by the producer into using the N-word in the holiday in Cambodia and felt a little weird about it. And then when D.H. Poligro joined the band, I asked him specifically about that. And I can't remember exactly what, I, what he said, but I never used it again mm. in that song. Mm. Wrong, you know. But um, so you kind of have to be sensitive at the same time. I mean, a, an African-American uh, pundit who I was on a panel with also at the University of Colorado at a different event called the Conference on World Affairs. Um, he was on Fox from time to time, and he knew how to bait me and get my goat. He said the Frankenchrist album was one of the things that inspired him to become a conservative. Hmm. What? But then when I referred to a certain right-wing extremist judge who's too mean to die for another 20 years on the Supreme Court, by the name of Clarence Thomas, I called him Clarence Uncle Thomas. Hmm. And the other guy said, you can't say that. You can't call anybody an Uncle Tom. And I got defensive when I should have just paused for a minute. Okay, it's not worth it. If that comes across that way, I have to respect how the other person feels hmm. and the other group of people feel. Okay, I'm glad he told me this because we're... Soon we're going to record the song Clean as a Thistle for the first Guantanamo School of Medicine album, The Audacity of Hype. And he's called that in there because he was a sexual predator. So I renamed him Clarence Peeping Thomas. Hmm. Problem solved and just in time because otherwise other people would have seen that and hmm. whatnot. But I can't just like trim everything down like that i mean there's a line in tea party revenge porn someone's got to stand up for the stupid god damn it and there's gonna people who are gonna call microaggression and trigger this that and the other maybe on that line maybe something else sorry that one stays thank you very much for coming through and being an excellent interview and just i don't know i, I hon you. honestly I, I think you should take this to twitch i don't know why you're not doing this on twitch already I think what well, you're, you're doing, the one who told me about Twitch. Well, well, you, I'm not you, you, a need, you need to dude. get out. You need to get out here. What, what you're doing all day, but I'm open to ideas. What you're doing, what you're saying, and and what you've been doing with uh, what would Jello do? I I, th I think would work in the live online context, either stream over here or even on YouTube. I don't I don't know well, if on I don't know if on Twitch future, I can advocate for streaming on YouTube, but I think you should stream live somewhere. And you told me that you left Patreon for Twitch TV for a reason. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm still on Patreon, but I'm doing Twitch in addition because it's, it's working out here too. Well, good. You know, I, 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 we talked about this when we were doing the other check the day before. And normally I wouldn't do that for anybody. You know, once I'm on, that's what you get. No pre-interviews, no nothing. Hmm. But in this case, I'm glad we talked. So, yeah. uh, hey, everybody out there. First up on the block is finally getting the Tea Party Revenge Porn album out there there's going to be more videos and at least the audio version is going to drop as soon as we can get it dropped and i'm, I'm seeing but i'm, I'm seeing i'm seeing people in chat to come later i'm seeing people in chat say that they would watch you on twitch just just to right, let you know. that's what i'm saying the gears are turning okay i don't know what i'm gonna do yet but okay. the gears have begun to turn so stay tuned you twitchy people <laughs> all right man thank you for coming on Adios. All right. Have a good one.